Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is this is about your power. So also there'll be a little Q&A session after this. I'll make sure I leave a little bit of time. So if while you're getting this presentation, if you have a question, something that's deep in your heart, your soul, your spirit, and you want to know what the answer is to that question, this will be a good time to ask that question if it's not answered within this presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to establish some principles, and obviously many here are um, well aware of their uh, progress in spirituality and have studied enough of the knowledge to be able to to understand what I'm going to be talking about, but there probably will be some people who don't understand anything about the spiritual knowledge or have a little bit of knowledge and we're going to need to fill in some blanks. So I'm saying that because I want to let you know I'm not going to assume that you know about everything that we're going to discuss here today and just go off with it. I want to establish a foundation of something that we call the universal language. So let us go ahead and begin. The first thing that I want you to take a look at here is some cymatic images. And of course, many are aware of cymatics, but for those who are not, cymatics are the actual tones or shapes that you get when you play tones. And this is a part of the universal language. The universal language is sound, shape, and color. I'll say that again. Sound, shape, and color, because every sound has a shape and a color. Every shape has a sound and a color, and every color has a sound and a shape. And that's most important to realize, especially when studying esoteric knowledge, because you begin to start being able to make connections that otherwise wouldn't be so obvious. Now, how it's really come to us as far as this connection between sound, shape, and color and these images that you're seeing now is actually through a device that looks like this. And this is actually called a cymoscope. And a cymoscope is, is this object that there's a, uh, obviously a speaker coil as you can see, centered in the middle of the object, and then there's water, and then there's a camera to take the image of the frequencies that are being played through the device. And through this process, we've gotten much more familiar with the in-depth patterns and shapes behind cymatics. Also, you have your classic cymatic plates. This is called a Shalotny device. Many have probably seen this before. This is where you put salt onto a plate and you begin to play a tone, and as that tone begins to resonate, then you begin to see a pattern, the pattern that corresponds with that tone. So once again, we're getting deeper into the universal language. We find that sound actually equals a shape, and here is the proof of that. The next level is, of course, to establish the color, and what you're actually seeing in this diagram is the standard intonation chart of uh, fa, fa sol la ti, do re mi fa sol la ti, and also the corresponding frequencies in herds, and then also the color spectrum or the colors that those sounds make. So now we have an establishment between sound, shape, and color, but this is actually quite ancient knowledge all the way up until the even modern times that there's always, it's always been known that there's a correlation between sound, shape, and color, and here's the musical scale, or the diatomic scale, and exactly how the tones on that scale make colors and what those colors are. So that's the first of this part of knowledge that I want you to understand is the introductory of the universal language because the universal language is the language that everything speaks and it is our original language. And when we begin to use that language, we can communicate with all life forms. The next thing here, because we're going to get into obviously the head of this um, this, the, the title of this particular presentation is Advanced Spiritual Curriculum and Quantum Field Activation. And I thought that the best way to actually get something like that going within the individual is actually to begin to introduce them to cosmic geometry and biological geometry and symbolism and also linguistics and how that affects you in everyday life and how you use this system in order to create power within and also to begin to emit power and create things that are without. So the next level of this, we have to actually go into the cosmos because I will need to introduce everyone first to what the cosmos is doing. 
And this is very interesting because a lot of times we wonder, you know, why is it the cosmos intervening in some of the situations that we're involved in? And, you know, maybe there's an imbalance in the cosmos, but unfortunately, for many people, they find out that that's not true, that the cosmos actually is in perfect balance, and it balances itself through positive, negative, and neutral, and it does have an overarching goal, agenda, or purpose, and that is the meaning to all things, which is energy, and the projection and regeneration of perpetual energy. So I will have to explain this. There's no diagrams to actually show it unless we create it. And what it's really about is exactly how you get into the world, but more specifically, your purpose here and your connection with everything. And so how this works is what we would say is the oversoul. This is like the grown-up or adult version of you beyond the body. Some see the sun as a variation of an oversoul, sends emissions, and these emissions are in the form of light because they're in the highest densities. And that light then pierces into the envelope, also known as the womb, also known as the matrix, also known as water. And when it embeds itself through that piercing into those physical planes or wombs, then it begins the generation process. Now, the interesting part is, is that when we're admitted from the oversoul, we are in exact identical of our oversoul. And how this would look is it would look like we're in seed germ or seed form. And obviously there are many seeds on the planet and they do bear a lot of interesting geometry once you get into the geometry. But the seed form is in fact containing the compressed sound and energy of the oversoul. And the purpose of the seed and its geometry is to actually create a resonance between the seed and the oversoul. So if we put this in traditional sense, then we have a connection, sometimes called an umbilical cord, sometimes called a silver line, some call it the anchor in the chasm, but we have a connection with our oversoul that allows us to send and receive energy the same way that we're receiving energy from the celestial bodies, receiving energy from the sun, etc. And this becomes something that, that you have to look deep into because it also means that within each seed there is the whole and the only process that's actually taking place is that we're growing up and that's why humans grow upwards. We're growing up in order to actually become in ide an identical to our oversoul or our graduated state. And we begin here first as the seed germs, and as long as the seed is cultivated properly, and that's why there's a huge need for gardeners or people who understand husbandry or understand how to actually cultivate seeds in a reality and allow them to become to their maximum strength. Because what happens is, is that this creates a bridge of perpetual energy that connects us and our ancestors and all there is in the cosmos. And so this is very important because it actually gets us into exactly why we would need to maintain a connection with our higher self and actually eventually become our higher self. So today we're talking about the oversoul, but this knowledge that you're going to receive is going to actually let you learn how to separate, to, to decrease the separation between you and your oversoul and also actually become that. So also remember that every time there's a penetration, there's also an imprint or an image that's also often referred to as a mark that does resonate the actual identity of the oversoul. And that's actually what symbolism is. Symbolism is the seed form or two-dimensional form of something that is, has the magnitude and power that, well, how can I put this? The magnitude and power is still in baby form and it's growing up, but still the seed possesses all of that magnitude and all of that power. So we're gonna keep going here. And we're going to show here again this transition. And what this transition is about is actually in densities. So you start to see the connection because the connection here is actually every single life form is filling a specific space in the continuum, meaning that the colors that we see on the spectrum, the density of life forms that we see on the spectrum, the variation of personalities that we see on the spectrum, the zodiacal signs that we see on the spectrum. All of this is spaced out 
to create a bridge between the oversouls and the seeds in order to create a continuum of perpetual energy. So this is the main purpose of the creation here on earth is continue to continue having that bridge and also to allow us to remain connected to our energetic force. So now we begin to move into the deeper part of this because obviously we have some very esoteric knowledge that we want to reveal today. And the first part of that is actually the world or what I would refer to as the word and the world. Now we start to begin to see that these actual terms are very identical. In fact, the word is the same as the world except for adding an L. And in linguistics and etymology, you learn that the symbol of the L actually means in ancient languages the symbol of the God. So what's actually being said here is the supreme being can in fact create worlds through words. And as we go on, we'll start to see that words have, and tones and vibrations have everything to do with the creation of word, worlds. And we see that this world is actually the wave or the spiral and the frequency that emits as we speak tones and vibrations. So let's get a little bit deeper here just to give you some examples. We have here what many refer to as a mantra, okay? And what mantras are, are mantras are seeds in emanations of created worlds. I'm going to let that soak in for just a minute. The tones that you hear in a mantra, and that's why there's always a, a purpose within the mantra to actually pronounce it correctly, because what they actually are is they're seeds to worlds. And when, let's say, you have a thousand petal lotus, then you have a thousand syllable mantra that must be said perfectly in order for that world to be realized. So the whole purpose of mantra is to actually bring the energy of a specific world. Now, of course, there's tons of mantras just as there's tons of worlds and each of the tones and the vibrations create unique variations in these worlds. So to prove that even more, you now come to a mandala, which is actually a visual, a visual representation of a mantra. And mandalas are often used, especially if you look into the Tibetan system, is they're used to create patterns that eventually become embedded within the consciousness. So that when the Lama is doing the astral travel, then they're able to astral travel to a specific place. Also in the vision or also in the meditation, they're able to travel in to a specific place. So a mandala then is a two-dimensional imprint of worlds. And again, they're memorized to promote astral travel into that world. So this is what you would see if you took a mandala and took it into a three-dimensional format. So this is known as a kingdom, and it's brought about through the chanting and the tones and the vibrations that are going across time. Now, I'll explain that. See, every time we say something, even though it may get less and less as far as audibly, it's still traveling because it will even move through walls. And when sound is moving through walls, then it gets smaller. So it comes out of the visual, uh, it, excuse me, it comes out of the audible spectrum of what we can hear, but it's still playing a sound. And that sound actually sounds like a ringing in your ear. That's actually not tinnitus. Generally, it's the presence of an energetic form. So these tones and vibrations, and that's why there's chanting going on across a continuum in order to create a bridge, meaning that ancient cultures chanted to connect to their ancestors that were doing that same chanting across another level of the timeline. And so this becomes very, um, an, another very important fact that we actually connect to our ancestors, even subconsciously and through meditation. And we can connect to those ancestors from thousands and thousands of years ago. So what does that mean? What that means is, is that the ability that we have to use our tones and vibrations and not only our mental or frontal lobe projections allow us to break what we would call time, the speed of light, 
and those kind of things that hinder what we would call the world from the living to the world from what we perceive as the dead, but which is really the afterlife, which takes place on another time frame. So it gets even deeper, though, with language, that when we start to really study language, we find that language and symbolism do run hand in hand. They never should be separated from one another. Languages are symbols. Mathematical expressions are symbols. So even in studying the symbols in math, like the division symbol, you find that there's one dot, another dot, and a line in the middle. And that means division. So what's being said is one dot is, let's say, the uh, spiritual body. And then another dot is the other spiritual body. And then the line in the middle is the realm in which that separates those two spiritual bodies. And that brings up division. So as we said before, these lines that you see, and you'll see it in concentric circles, you'll see it in spirals, those lines that you see in between those areas are actually what separate one realm from another. And when utilizing another body, which could be your voice, which could be your astral projection, it could be another vehicle like your ran, which is an Egyptian term for your astral body, you can pierce through those membranes because they are like veils in between one dimension and another. So sound, the sounds that we can emit and the thoughts that we have actually do that. But if you look at this chart, there's something even deeper to be revealed, and it's the connection between language and geology. Because what we'll find is, is that the first characters, and there's a book called uh, The Passing of Rivers, or there's a language called The Passing of Rivers, and then there's another book that's called The Four Rivers of Life. And what this book starts to show is that the rivers on the earth are actually lined out to the constellations in the cosmos and that the first languages were actually developed on those patterns. And in addition to that, the zodiac, as we know it, was actually, was, a, was actually used in order to create the language. The symbols within the stars that we call the zodiac are also used to create the symbols within language, in this case, Hebrew. And then when you put all of those languages together or all those words together, then they create a specific symbol. In this case, the Megan star, which is very ancient. So now we're starting to see the connection within all of this. And I'm going to take a moment to recap so that way it all starts to really connect for you. So because sound is shape, is color, it means that every time we say something, we're literally creating a world. But the perfection in what we're saying determines whether that world comes into existence, whether that seed grows up to become a manifestation, or it becomes null and void, meaning it falls into the chasm of nothingness. And let's look at a good explanation of that here. What you'll see is, is you'll see, these are one of the more uh, ch uh, older charts of antiquity, that the language, and this is of course a priest, is to be pronounced a certain kind of way in order to activate the actual tone itself. And that's done by the palatial, it's done all the way down into the chest. And because the whole purpose here is, is that, see in English, English just really the top of the mouth is used. Not, and then maybe a little bit above what we would call the Adam's apple is used, but very little of the guttural tones that you see in the ancient languages. And there's a reason for this, because when you have the ancient language, you're actually speaking all the way from down deep. And then the word goes up through your passages, which would be your chakra centers, and then comes out of your mouth in full manifestation because you've now taken that word and you've pronounced it properly. So what you're seeing here is, is the diagram showing that where the words are actually pronounced and how that connects with the windpipe and how that actually connects with other parts of the body. So that way when a word is pronounced in order for it to fully manifest, then it must go through the chakra centers of the being. So this lets you know right away that you have this power of being able to bring something from what we would say is the subjective plane into the physical plane. So generally that's called from inception to conception. Inception is the idea or the thought of it, right? And then so that idea and that thought starts and that's the inception 
And then the conception is if you can actually birth it into a physical world. Now remember, the process of birthing something in from the astral to the physical means that the seed or the word not only must be pronounced properly, but it must be put into the space or the environment in which it needs to grow. And that's actually the whole part of why the elements became so important, because if you were trying to accomplish something specific, then you would go into the environment that promoted that vibration and tone and nourished it properly in order for it to come to manifestation. Now, of course, today this is called magic, but there actually was no use for languages beyond this purpose, meaning that there was actually no use for speaking verbally except for to create things. So many of the life forms and many of the things that we see here in the world today were created from using the tones and vibrations that the ancestors spoke. And these tones and vibrations have been existing throughout antiquity and even before time. So let's move a little bit further here because now we see another diagram because I know some may ask, well, what about English? Because we talked about Hebrew and how when Hebrew is connected together that it makes a two-dimensional symbol called a Megan star. When you take English, which is actually a cognate of Futhark ruin and you, rune stones, and you put all of that together along with even the numbers and certain key symbolism that's used in the reality, you actually get this symbol. And this is known as the monogram of English because it contains every single pattern necessary to bring forth everything from the English language and the Futhark runes. In addition, when you study occultism, you find out that this is actually the diagram of the incarnated world that most are living in now if they've taken on the English language in their mind and they, have, they don't have another variation such as their own imagination or their own ancestral tongue, etc., in order to allow them to realize that the world is much more than just this symbol. So these symbols actually become more or less embedded within our consciousness and then begin to unpack themselves. So symbols, once again, are encrypted expressions of vast states of thought. And why is that? It's because the origins of a symbol come from the oversoul and then it embeds itself, and then it's left to be unpacked. And that's what we're seeing within the diagrams that were shown. Obviously, again, this is a two-dimensional symbol of something that is yet to be unpacked. And then when it's unpacked, it comes out like this. And so what governs whether or not it can be unpacked is if it's put into the consciousness. This could be collective consciousness. This could be personal consciousness. If it's put into a collective or conscious environment in order for it to completely unfold itself. So that means that if a person doesn't believe this is true, they don't believe that their words have any power, they don't believe that there's any connection to the English language and spelling or spells and magic and all that kind of stuff, then it means that it never actually generally comes to fruition what they're attempting to manifest. But we also have learned with things like the secret and those kind of systems that what you think about and what you focus on does indeed begin to manifest. But that's a light version and explanation of what's really going on. The next thing that we have to take a look at here is actually planetary geometry. And obviously I did a flat earth panel, so I'm the flat earth panel, so I'm not talking about just balls spinning around in the air. In fact, I revealed a little bit during that session that all celestial bodies, and I'll repeat that again, all celestial bodies are planets or stars, which are the spirits of the celestial bodies, but moving in the deep meaning that they're actually moving in the water of the ocean that surrounds Earth, which is pretty much infinite. And their orbits create these patterns, and these patterns are because their shapes, their tones, their vibrations, and their modes of thought. And this is how we've come to actually understand even the gods, and that's why this, the gods generally represent themselves under these symbolism. Now, there's been a big corruption between what gods are, because the word god actually means the Germanic god, Gud. 
So in every tense, I'm going to use a term that makes it a little bit easier, which is supreme being. You are a supreme being. You are a cosmos within. And the images that I'm showing you are just small variations and, and uh, portions of what you truly are. So if you look back into the Enlightenment era, you'll find that this knowledge was already known. In this diagram, you actually see somewhat of an explosion of the cosmic bodies that are embedded within the being. Here's a chart that makes it easier to understand. I'm going to hold on that for a while and then come back to it. But it just means that all of these celestial bodies or what we call a cosmos is inside of you. So this is why you can actually create with words of power because indeed you are a supreme being and you have those tones and vibrations moving through you and you have the environment in order to create things using those tones and vibrations. So the act of creation itself is something that can be done by any being that is aware of their power. And in fact, many people have children, so they're already witnessing their form of creation, of putting in their seed and allowing that seed to go into the womb, and then the womb beginning to manifest a baby version or a smaller version of the adult so that it grows up to emulate the adult. Now, our duty as parents then would be to keep growing to the stage of the oversoul so that way our children see our growth and then also follow the route that we go and begin to grow up into their total and full potential, which is actually limitless. Now, some more proof that this embedding of our chakra centers or the celestial bodies within us. So let's talk about a couple things that are synonymous with one another. It would be our organs in our body, chakras, geometry, mandalas, mantras. So all of that is actually the full comprising of the human being. So we have a lot of power within us, and that power is yet to be manifested within many. But with this kind of knowledge, you begin to realize, hey, this all connects. It's more difficult for me to believe that this is not happening. And then I better start to think about my own personal power versus bowing down or worshiping something or believing in something external or just not doing anything with the magnificent gift that you've been given. Now, here we have another ancient chart. And this chart, once again, shows those expressions of geometry embedded within the body. That's what's here. If you can still see it distinguished, again, it's rather old, so it came in a parchment that was slightly damaged. But if you notice that there's a reference to the zodiac signs, as you've seen in many charts about your chakra centers, etc. And there's a reference to the geometry of the orbits of the celestial bodies. And again, that's because the seed germs that have been used in order to create the composite being that we're calling human all have in themselves specific geometry. And when we start looking at that a little bit more, we start to realize why the tones, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, or the actual mantras that are used for the chakras were so important because they actually do create these patterns. And that's why you can heal your chakras through tones and vibrations because it actually allows them to resonate. Because remember what we talked about, it's all resonance, that the reason why you have a connection with the oversoul is because there is an imprint of the oversoul inside of you and through resonance, you have that connection and that connection is very similar to magnetics. And I'll explain something very simple here. If you hold two magnets together in the attracting poles when they snap together, if you pull them apart, you can feel the force between the two. But as you pull them apart further and further, you feel less and less of that force. But it doesn't mean that force is gone. In fact, if you take one magnet and you go to the other side of the world and you still have that other magnet at your house, there is still a connection or a link between those two magnets. And in fact, there's a collect connection and link between all magnetic fields. And that's what our ancestors utilized to communicate what we call synchronicity, to harness power across the grid, which we call the ley lines, and many different things that actually come out today as geomancy. So we're gonna talk about that in just a moment, but I do wanna clarify on this chart, what you're seeing is, is you're seeing the vowels and how their, to their tone and vibration, you see the connection with those tones and vibrations and mandalas, so you understand or understand that every time you say something, a partial world is coming out of your mouth. 
And then deeper, even deeper, you see the connection between these patterns and your DNA. And that's why the more centered that you get into yourself, the more you begin to perfect your own consciousness, the more power and ability you have to control your destiny. And that's why this becomes so important. Like, and I'll pause for a minute here because I do have a minute and 30 and it looks like we're still, you know, we're almost through with the presentation and ready to get a question, but we do have some time. But I do want to explain something that I've seen because I've been teaching for now seven years publicly and studying this spiritual knowledge since I was five years old. And what I found was the greatest hindrance to our process was actually us getting stuck in dogmatic and religious systems. Now, I will put a disclaimer there that many of these things are steps for us on the ladder. They're actually in charge of governing some of the energy until we start realizing exactly what is going on. Meaning that when there's a lot of energy and that energy fills you at one time, it may be too much for your vessel to hold. So sometimes these systems can work as being able to regulate those energies before you're ready to turn yourself on to the total reality of you as a supreme being. And that could be, in my book, their only purpose, that one should continuously move up the ladder of total realization and realize that there is no God in the sky that one should be worshiping or bowing down to, that one should actually be looking in and within, which we call inner standing, and then start to really connect with themselves because the universe is inside of you. Because just imagine, all of what I reveal within this last 33 minutes is paramount to time travel, hyper levels of sentience, cross communication beyond time, invention of things that are not yet under the sun or in this reality, connection with totality. So we're talking about the big stuff here. And this is, of course, why this knowledge has been so governed in our reality and also hidden because of the power that it possesses. It possesses the power to put you in the driver's seat as the Lord and master of your own life rather than some other uh, entity or life form or whatever that they're bringing to you next in order for you to be controlled through another system. So I'll keep going here, but just realize once again that this connection is very powerful and it's something that you have within you already. It's not something that you need to go and find somewhere. All you have to do is begin to connect with it. You have this imagery. As I said, you could check us out at Secret Energy. A lot of this stuff has been made available. You could do your own research on cymatics. You can dig a little bit deeper into what, what mantras and mandalas are. What I also do recommend, though, is before you go saying any mantra and mandala that you understand and learn what tones and vibrations really do, because we do know some people who've gotten in trouble with pronouncing tones and vibrations and mantras and all that kind of stuff and not understanding the true intention behind what they're doing. So I have to go even deeper. I'm going to go into the genetic level of the human being with something that few know about, and it's called phosphenes. And phosphenes are actually, when we press into our eyes, which is a form of meditation, you press into your eyes for about five to seven minutes, or excuse me, not that long, but about two to three minutes, excuse me, even less time, 30 seconds, you begin to see these black and white patterns. And when phosphenes were examined, like the black and white patterns that are seen in the, in the mind's eye, it was connected immediately with drawings that children make, the, po the most powerful symbols in the world, also known as the ineffable names of God, the concave pentagram, 1111, everyone's familiar with that, I'm sure, Om, the spiral. So all of these symbols are actually found on the genetic level of the human being. So this is also why a person can be triggered by these symbols so easily. So if we're living in a society that uses this kind of symbolism, as we're seeing here in McDonald's signs or in corporation signs or in clothing, then that would trigger the person to more of an ancestral recount of their primordial existence. And so they would feel some kind of connection to that. So this is actually what we have to worry about. If there's anything to worry about, this is what we would need to, to be wise about. I guess that, that's probably a better word, is when symbolism is used to actually control consciousness. So you're seeing here organic 
Venus, organic Saturn at their poles. And then now what you're seeing here in this image is inorganic Venus inverted and inorganic Saturn inverted. And this is called drawing down the power of the stars. This is actually geomancy. This is when the energy or the correspondence of the zodiacal sign is utilized and embedded within the geology or the actual geometric construct in the streets or on the ground. And then that energy is brought forth and harnessed. And in this tense, what you'll find is, is that there is no good and bad planets. What you actually have is there's a positive, a negative, and a neutral. Because remember, even within yourself, you're not only a planet, you're also a universe. So this means, as you know, you have your good side, and then you have your bad side, and then what you're working to do in most cases is to find your neutral or your harmonic balance, right? So in this case, in this geomancy, what's brought forth is instead of Saturn's upright status, which is wisdom, fatherhood, focus, patience, willpower, Saturn's inverted aspects, which is ignorance, vengeance, malice, and death is brought forward. And this, of course, is the, the geomancy that's in the streets of Washington, D.C. Once again, you have Venus, when upright, creates love, connectivity, sweetness, and passion, but when inverted, brings lust and disharmony and divorce, etc. So this is how geomancy is used in order to draw down the power of the stars in order to infuse the area and all the things that are going on in that area, the laws, the rules, the people who are walking in that territory, the decisions that are made in this White House, etc. And then I'm sure some caught that there's an inverted owl embedded within the, in the street. And the only way you know what direction it's facing is by how they point the pentagram and the geometry lets you see what is true north. And so all the symbolism here is inverted. So instead of the owl being upright, the owl is actually inverted, which is actually a sign of ignorance because the sign uh, turned upright is a sign of intelligence. So I also encourage people to, instead of judging a lot of this symbolism right away and saying, oh, that's evil, to realize that everything in the reality has a positive, a negative, and a neutral. And it's for us to divine the true meaning of things. But once again, there's another deeper level of this, and where this is our last level of depth, and then we're going to start taking some questions here, and that's how these signs and symbols that I mentioned earlier can be utilized in order to provoke a level of thought and a feeling inside of your consciousness that may instinctually feel right. And so this means that the level of manipulation that we're dealing with in the world today actually is utilizing the symbolism in order to trigger us into believing certain things and then that symbolism is taken and basically formed and fashioned into the idealism of whatever they want you to think. So what you're looking at here on the top is actually radiolaria and this is George Haeckel's work on discovery of pulling things from the ocean during the Enlightenment era. What you're then seeing on the left is what we would call now the Maltese cross, which you now see on the crest of Knights Templar and most secret societies. And that's used as a symbol of power, but its original origin is actually from the ocean. That's why it tends to connect back to the Mer Merovingians or the Holy See, because they're direct plagiarizations from things taken from our mother or our womb. So what you're seeing, just in a nutshell, is symbolism is taken from the origins of life. And then that symbolism is in turn used to trigger our consciousness into believing in something that actually has a far more primordial existence than what generally is depicted. So we see even in the center, a radial area that looks like the Virgin Mary but is actually something that is pulled from the ocean that may indeed contain that kind of essence. In addition, addition you see another cross that is pulled from the ocean, and in, a, in the end, most geometry you'll find, pentagrams, hexagons, etc., are found in the ocean. So they don't actually have a connection with many of these religious systems and dogmas. They have a, collect, a connection more with what goes on in the ocean and how that comes about in our reality today. 
But I do want to say before we come to a conclusion that you need to know where your power comes from. And what that's going to allow you to do is it's going to allow you to not be fooled by all these systems that are out here that are claiming that, you know, they have the power and that, you know, that you should worship them and that the symbols belong to them because that actually begins to distort our consciousness. And then when you begin to see all this and study what I'm showing you, you begin to see not only that this comes from an organic nature, but also that it's within you. And so the only thing necessary is for you, begin, for you to begin to study self. And then when you study self, then you unlock all things. Next generation of science. Is there any way in which one?